You are watching the press preview, a first look at what's on the front pages as they arrive. It's time to see what's making the headlines with the Daily Mirror columnist, Susie Boniface, and the CEO of Total Politics Group, Mark Wallace. They'll be with us from now until just before midnight. So let's see what's on some of those front pages for you now. The Sun leads with a new line of inquiry in the disappearance of Nicola Bully, reporting that police are pursuing the possibility that she may have tried to retrieve her dog ball from the river wire. That element of the story is also the main line for the mail. Rishi Sunak is preparing for a legal battle to stop migrants who cross the channel in small boats from appealing against their deportation. That's on the front of the Times. The Guardian hears that a former Foreign Office official is to sue after being sacked for giving an anonymous interview about what she perceived to be the government's mishandling of the fall of Kabul to the Taliban. The Telegraph says the government intends to make online misogynistic abuse a crime. According to the Eye, there are renewed supply problems with hormone replacement therapy drugs which are affecting millions of women across the country. The Express quotes excerpts from Boris Johnson's TV interview with his former culture secretary, Nadine Dorries, in which he says he believes the Conservatives can win the next election, especially if they cut taxes. The Financial Times reports that the FTSE 100 share index reached an all-time high today. The Mirror says a celebrity special of Who Wants to Be a Millionaire has been put on hold after three women allegedly refused to work with Jeremy Clarkson following his article about Meghan Markle. And the Star has the story of a West Midlands village apparently being terrorised by an aggressive owl. A reminder that by scanning the QR code you'll see on screen during the programme, you can check out the front pages of tomorrow's newspapers while you watch us. And we are joined tonight by Susie Boniface and Mark Wallace. Welcome to you both. Um, let's start with the story of uh, Nicola Bully. Um, uh, terrible story that, that, that we've encouraged. Very, very, very sad story uh, indeed. The front page of The Sun pointing to this riddle of the lost dog ball that they're now looking at. Susie. Yeah, I... <laughs> I know there are lots of people all over the country who are horrified by this and who are also playing armchair experts and, you know, making out that they have some kind of insight when the police and the family and the people that are there are, are going to have far better guess at it than any of us. But having said that, and as a dog owner myself, if your dog's ball goes in the river, you say goodbye to the ball. And that you don't go in after it. And Nicola seems to be a fairly sensible person. I don't think she would have, have done that. She's also supposed to be quite a decent swimmer. And if you did end up in a river, you would just get rid of the coat that the police think has dragged her down. Um, it doesn't explain why her body hasn't been found. And more than anything else, just as a dog owner, if you've got a spaniel, as Nicola did, that those those animals love water and if their owner goes in the river i'd have thought the spaniel would be straight in there after her you wouldn't better keep it out so i just i can't see this explanation really being the, the full answer that we'll end up with in the fullness of time put it that way that horrible accidents do happen people do slip and fall and get sucked down into terrible whirlpools and so on um i don't think we've got the full we haven't got the full answers yet and i just feel terribly sorry for her family that are you know, plainly this week, in the interviews they've given, they're not um, terribly happy with perhaps the way some of the investigation seems to be going, saying that there's no way that she just disappears, you know. But yet that seems to be what the police are still saying. She has just disappeared. Yes, her partner saying that it's it's uh, as if she's just disappeared, as you say, into to thin air. But, but, Mark, I suppose the police must look at every possibility, um, no, no matter how far-fetched it, it might be. Well, they must look at every possibility, but I confess this is part of what troubles me a little bit about this uh, story appearing in lots of the papers uh, tomorrow morning, which in various papers is described as the police's working assumption. Now, 
I'm sure the police are considering a variety of different theories, but assumptions are risky things in investigations. And the fact is that, just as Susie says, we don't know what's happened. That's the whole uh, point at issue in this story. We don't know. Um, it seems like they seem to have tracked down a, a pretty precise timeline of large portions of uh, the events leading up to her disappearance. And there's a, there's a gap in time which is as yet unaccounted for. But assumptions can be risky things because they can drive groupthink and they can drive people to disregard a, a, other possibilities. But ultimately, while this is a huge story, rightly, and a, a, you know, a, a very troubling mystery, it's also a you know, devastating personal story. Every uh, every family's worst nightmare to have uh, somebody go missing without knowledge, that explanation, and then have to try and account particularly to the young children who are missing their mum. Yes, terribly sad, as we've said. I mean, one of the things that, that they're looking at is this um, missing 10 minutes, which strikes me as being quite crucial now to the investigation, Susie. Yeah, and it's what's in those 10 minutes. And, of course, if in an ideal world, if the, the dog would be able to tell us if there was some way of only communicating with Willow. Um, but I agree with Mark. One of the most devastating things that's gone wrong with so many big murder uh, hunts and, and missing person inquiries that I've covered as a reporter, the thing that's gone wrong is twofold. First off is the group think that he mentioned, the decision that it must be X, therefore that's what we're going to concentrate on, which means that you do stop thinking about the other possibilities sometimes. That has happened in numerous investigations. And secondly, when they have a big lot of media attention, uh, often at a time of year when other news is a bit quiet, perhaps, and so the media are really focused on something, it it kind of changes the way the police investigation operates. It shouldn't, and it's not the media's fault, it's the police's fault when they allow that to pressurise them in the way they investigate things. But unfortunately, forces that aren't used to having a big lot of, you know, media turn up and asking questions and and going through things, they they can sometimes have the wrong reaction to it. And I think what Mark pointed out there about having a press conference saying this is our working assumption is it's not a wise thing to have done on the police's part. I hope they're right and I hope that they've they've got everything sussed and that, that whatever's happened to Nicola, she didn't suffer any great pain or anything like that. But um, I think just saying that kind of thing in public is probably not wise. Mm. Mark, do you think it's it's premature that them saying that uh, anything suspicious has now been ruled out? They're saying they're as sure as they can be that she did not walk away from from the riverbank. Well, we always have to bear in mind the possibility that we don't know everything uh, in this discussion and, and you know this this evening on the show that maybe the police know in their investigation. Maybe they know. Uh, maybe, maybe they have more indicators than than they were aware of. However. If it is the case that they don't know what's happened, that remains the conclusion. Um, I don't think you can responsibly rule out um, other scenarios. You can't rule them in either. I, the, 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 the fact is, we don't know. The police's the police's account, the official position, continues to be that this is unexplained. And I think if it's unexplained, it seems, as Susie says, it does seem irresponsible to start ruling out any other possibility. There have unfortunately been mistakes made in the past um, and things overlooked um, in the past because people move to working assumptions and they write things off. And I can understand in that scenario as the family, uh, for the family of a missing person in, 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 in the middle of a situation like this, of course, the last thing you also want to hear is a simultaneous message that, well, we don't know the answer, but we're ruling out a whole range of different things. If they don't know, it should be, surely the question remains open. Yeah, that's one of the things you've got the press attention is that they're, they're des the police are sort of desperate to have an answer to the questions. And rather than doing, as Mark just suggested, they're saying, well, look, we're ruling nothing in and ruling nothing out. They're so desperate to think of something and, and to, they, mm. they, they go further than they should do sometimes with their public I mean, statement. I think, I, I, okay. I think it's fair to say that you know, there, there is an extraordinary amount of pressure, particularly in the modern age, on any authority, any investigation like this, because we're so used to the idea that you... You hear people say this all the time in circ around circumstances like this. You can't just vanish. And we're used to the idea that everything's tracked, the CCTV, CCTV everywhere. People map their jogs and their runs and they uh, dial into things all the time. Um, and it's probably more alarming, I think, more challenging to the kind of modern mindset than perhaps it might have been previously, that uh, in, in, pre in previous generations, which puts pressure on 
But as Susie said, it is the job of the police to resist that. Yes. Let's uh, move on to the Express. And uh, Susie, Boris Johnson is saying that he believes the Conservatives can win the next election. Yes. Um, the one thing I think you could probably... Well, there are many things you could probably say to find the rule of Boris Johnson as Prime Minister. One of them is arguably the ability to talk things up, shall we say, because I can't say what I would actually call he what he was talking most of the time. Um, and being you know, the boosterism and being positive and rah, everything be marvellous, chaps, off we go, fa fa fa. Um, and this is just another example of the cloud cuckoo land that Boris Johnson probably thinks that everyone else should be living in. Um, it's notable that he he said this to the renowned interrogator Nadine Dorries, who obviously just let him say stuff um, without questioning him on, for example, the polls uh, and the science and uh, the general mood in the country, or the fact that he says the way to get back to power is to cut taxes when he's only got about 300 days left before the next election. That's probably not long enough to haul the economy round. And the last person who tried to cut taxes cost us 50 billion quid uh, not that long ago. So we could have done with some proper questions of Boris Johnson when he was talking about all this stuff. But for some reason, Gillian, he doesn't come and talk to you or me. He talks to Nadine Dorries, who doesn't ask him these things. Mark, is this a misplaced uh, optimism on his part, considering they are trailing Labour in the polls? I mean, I think any rational observer on any side of politics would say it's hugely challenging for the Conservatives. But you also, it's very important not to prejudge elections. You can never rule anything uh, in or out as a, a, as a possibility until polling day. What I think is quite interesting is the model for this kind of Boris interview, I don't think is the years which he spent in uh, Downing Street. I think they're the years that he spent in City Hall. One of the most, one of the periods that Boris Johnson played very artfully in his career and enjoyed a great deal was being the prince over the water, the great what if, while David Cameron was leader and then prime minister. He was able to sit in City Hall across the river in London uh, from, from Westminster, um, saying various disruptive things, kind of lobbing grenades into the discussion, becoming something that people could project, you know, all sorts of rebels around conservatism could project their... Um, their, their fancies onto of like, well, what if Boris was leader? Maybe he'd do all the different things that I might want. That I think suited him quite well. I think it built up, helped to build up and maintain his profile, which this is certainly doing. And of course, it also fulfilled, it kept alive that option that while you know, right now I don't think he frankly would like to go back into uh, Downing Street anytime soon, he found it pretty uncomfortable. That old saying of his, if the ball should come loose from the back of the pack and I was to happen to scoop it up, if it keeps a, some option open, then he's not going he's, he's to feel sorry but, about that. But so essentially, Mark, is, is, he, is he right, though? Yeah. Will the Conservatives win the next election? Just very briefly. I think the Conservatives, the Conservatives can win the next election. It's incredibly... But, but incredibly will they? Right? Will they? I don't know, and nor do you. <laughs> I have no idea. OK, let's, uh, let's move on. Just fit in this last story, um, Susie, about the Foreign Office whistleblower who's intending to sue. Got just under a minute on this. Yeah, every time... It's amazing. I've lost count of the number of times uh, since the 2010 general election that I've heard various Conservative prime ministers, and indeed I can definitely recall the current Chancellor of the Exchequer, Jeremy Hunt, saying this as Health Secretary, that whistleblowers must always be protected. And it's amazing. They were happy to say that when the whistleblowers were exposing things that had happened under the Labour government, like the Mid-Staff scandal, um, and not so happy when they're exposing things that happened under the Conservative government. Now, this isn't a party political point, because I would suspect that the same would happen the other way around as well. But the fact is, if you want to protect whistleblowers who are doing a public service to this nation when they blow a whistle then you damn well protect them, whether they're blowing the whistle on you or someone else. It's called principle, it's called morals, and this stinks. Yes, this is the exclusive interview with uh, Josie Stewart uh, and said that former colleagues felt their role was to protect ministers, some of whom were only interested in looking good rather than working in the interests of the public. But whistleblowers, um, as, as we know, are, are anonymous and it begs the question how they were tracked, tracked down, Mark, very quickly. Well, that, that is quite troubling. This arises from what was meant to be an anonymous um, uh, interview. I had some involvement around this same time as this story with another Foreign Office whistleblower who actually was somebody who'd formerly, uh, in, in, a, in a previous point in their career, had written for, for, for one of our sites. And he was very, very troubled by what he saw, partially 
around ministers, partially around, unfortunately, a kind of culture of, uh, you know, don't don't rock the boat among a variety of people in the Foreign Office in officialdom as well. And the fact is, it is an incredibly intimidating environment. It's intended to be so in order to try and deter people from speaking out and saying what's right. Just as Susie says, mm. this deserves proper protection. And ultimately, that's from all sorts of authority, regardless of party or institution. Yeah, I'm sure we'll be hearing much more about this uh, particular story. Mark and Susie, for the moment, thank you. We are going to take a break coming up. We'll tell you why Jeremy Clarkson might need to phone a friend when booking celebrity guests for the new series of Who Wants to Be a Millionaire? Do stay with us. Let's um, crack on with the stories and the, the eye. This story about uh, a shortage of HRT, which is vital for, for many women to simply function. Um, but women are struggling to find the hormone replacement medication because of supply problems, Susie. Yes, yeah, so what's happening is pharmacists are spending half their days ringing around trying to find the right suppliers for things. And this isn't just HRT that this is about. This is also about um, some penicillin byproducts. Uh, my daughter had a dose of scarlet fever a little while ago, and the one kind of treatment medicine for her, amoxicillin, wasn't around. She had to have the other one because it's just in short supply. Um, and there's lots of people who have said that some of the medicine shortages are down to Brexit, due to the EU, due to pandemic and blah, blah. Whatever it is, it's been going on for a very long time time and not only are there uh, women who are not getting their HRT and therefore some of them are going to be finding it very difficult to cope with daily life um, there are people who are not getting perhaps the medicine and the treatments and the regular prescriptions they're also expecting and they're not getting them at times they ought to that's going to have a massive knock-on impact uh, further down the road uh, with the NHS and, and the rest of, sort of our, our welfare system that uh, you know really needs addressing because if you if you don't get the medicine you need when you need it, when it's easy and cheap and simple, then you just have a more expensive problem further down the road that's harder to fix. Uh, Mark, according to the eye, drug manufacturers are saying that they're frustrated by the silence from the government. Yes, and actually, this is you know, the, the the ICE headline describes this as a new HRT shortage. From my understanding, this is not a new shortage. There was obviously an initial. Uh, out of shortages of HRT medication um, about a year ago. Um, but even before Christmas, there were reports that while there were, you know, there have been things like an official registry created of which, uh, which, which medicines in particular are facing shortages, those registries have been becoming out of date. They've not been reflected by what's happening on the ground. And if you're getting into what's now, a, you know, breaking cover as a second public major shortage in, in, in HRT, and as Susie says, in some other medicines, uh, that's a sign that all the solutions that were meant to happen a year ago have not succeeded. One thing I think is quite troubling is, remember, when everything was urgent in the pandemic, we saw some really good innovations, I think, in the way in which the regulators, the MHRA and so on, um, dealt with things like licensing, properly looking at supply. There should be, it should not be beyond the wit of human beings to say actually where there are medicines that are licensed in other equivalent um, yeah, regulatory regimes in other countries, we should be able to in some cases make an exception, copy and paste their licenses, accelerate approvals and help to free up supply. It might not be perfect, but it should at least help to deal with some of these problems. Yeah, but from what you're saying, it seems to corroborate the, the theory that the, the eyes uh, put out, that the, there is silence from the government. Let's move on to this last story. Uh, Jeremy Clarkson, um, we said in the, 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 the tease that he might need to phone a friend when booking celebrity guests for um, the quiz show, Who Wants to Be a Millionaire? Why so, Susie? Well, having written something really rather disobliging about Meghan Markle, in fact, flat out hateful, and having to apologise for it quite extensively, um, they're now finding that when they come to book female celebrities for uh, the celebrity version of I Want to Be a Millionaire, they, they all, um, they'd rather phone a friend shall we say, and and not be on air or anywhere near Jamie Clarkson, because probably because these are celebrities we're talking about, they feel that it would affect their brand in some way and they don't want to be um, associated with him. They don't think it's going to do them any favours to be on screen with him. I would like to put myself forward right now. I will nominate myself to go on screen with Jamie Clarkson because I would cough and go, misogynist, <coughs> all the way through. <laughs> and I think... That would probably uh, get us all through it. Susie, you've got your plan. Let's see if they, they give you that call. <laughs> uh, we're we're going to leave it there. Thank you very much, Susie and uh, Mark.